may be wondering why I am here. Okay? So you heard yesterday my name. Let me first say, on all of the introduction slides, what you're going to see, in some cases, is a little thing beginning with an at sign. Right? You know, this curly A in a circle. Right? Some of you may not know what that is. That's not a problem. This is a Twitter ID. So for those of you for whom Twitter means nothing, don't worry. For those of you who do like tweeting, then you can easily follow us with that code. And there is also a hashtag. Again, I may be speaking completely Chinese for some of you, but a hashtag, uh, which I believe is uh, hash sent GB, and maybe there's a sent FR, and that you can follow to get all of the tweets about the event. There'll be more on that later. But we'll also see more later on why social media is important for us. But anyway, you may be wondering, why me? Why am I here? Well, actually, I have a confession to make. I'm an alien. Now, I'm not an alien because I come from Mars or some planet peopled with green-faced pe uh, green, uh, people or something. No, I'm not even an alien because I'm English. Because an Englishman in Provence feels completely at home. I mean, half the people in Provence are English. So I feel great here. But I'm an alien because I am not from your world. I am not from the beauty world. I am not from the cosmetics or perfume industry. So what do I do? Well, let me first say I was nearly in the cosmetics and perfume industry because I started my career working at Procter & Gamble. Anyone here work for Procter & Gamble? Yep, we have a few. Welcome. Anyone here work for a competitor of Procter & Gamble? <laughs> Come on, there must be a few here. Any competitors of P&G? Admit it. Hey, well, I'm with you guys because I left. Okay? But when I started with P&G, I didn't work in fine fragrances. But I worked in the same office as the people, the brand managers, who were launching a great product at the time, which was Boss Perfume for Men. And I still use this today. But you know, that office in England smelt amazing, right? They even put the perfume in the toilet, so it was really great. I loved that. Then I moved to Belgium, as you do, and I was in charge of all of the IT infrastructure for a number of offices and plants. Now, one of those plants made washing powder. So I got a slightly different perfume. Not quite as nice, but still okay. That plant also made Pringles, right? And believe me, the plant smelt much stronger than the crisps. It wasn't really a great experience going on that production line. And then they put me in charge of a new plant in Koevoorden in the Netherlands, and that plant made dog food. And you could smell that one for miles around. You knew when you were getting close to Kuvorden because you were driving up the motorway and you saw the cows in the field with a clothes peg on their nose. That's how bad it was. So I had gone from this beautiful perfume to the smell of dog food. And I kind of thought, if this gets any worse, I have to get out. So I left PNG. And after a few years, at, uh, also at Hewlett-Packard, where I did some selling of uh, IT services, I decided I needed to do something different, right? I had dedicated my life at that time to making a positive contribution to collective intelligence. But I couldn't do it in the job I was in. And I found an area where my passion and what people told me were my talents coincided. And that was helping people to express their ideas, and training people, and inspiring people. So, you know when you go to a conference, right? So you're all here at this great congress, and you get that amazing question when you meet people. What do you do? And you tell them the company you work for, and your job title, right? And you hope that they know the company name, <laughs> that it means something to them, and also you hope that the job title is meaningful. And very often it's not. Right? At Hewlett-Packard, I was a pursuit director. And I said to people, hey, I'm a pursuit director. And they would say, so that means that you help the police to catch criminals? And I would say, okay, so it wasn't quite like that. So sometimes you have to explain what it is you do. 
So here's what I do. I change the world. Or more accurately, I help other people to change the world. Because the only reason to give a presentation is to change the world. And I'm a presentation coach, so I help people to change the world. Now, you know presentations, right? Most presentations suck really badly. Now, all of you here are still alive, which is amazing. I hope you'll still be alive at the end of this conference. But have you ever suffered death? Not just any kind of death, but a horrible kind of death. This is death by PowerPoint. Anyone suffered that? You know, this is the time when you sit down at a conference or in a meeting or something, and then somebody decides to spend 10 minutes connecting up their PC to the projector, and then they put something on the wall which looks like this, and then they turn around and they start reading it to you. And then you've got the choice either of trying to read the slide or listen to the person. But you don't want to do either. You just want to sit down and close your eyes and think, when is this going to be over? <laughs> so we said for Santifolio, we don't want that. We're going to stop the bullets. We are not here to shoot our audience. We are here to inspire our audience. And that's what I try to do. But it's not just a question of getting the slides right. It's also a question of making sure that the story is right. It's a making sure the speaker is right. So we have these three circles, right? Imagine these. The first is the story. When you're making a presentation, it's important to tell a story. It's important to have something with a clear introduction, a clear conclusion, and hopefully not too much stuff in between. But at least to make it interesting and memorable for people. And if you just recount fact, fact, generalization, it doesn't work. You have to tell stories. You have to give examples. And that's why it's important to really craft a story with your presentation. It needs to be a thing of beauty. And we'll talk more about beauty later. Of course, the speaker makes a difference. A fantastic story with a speaker who just basically stands there like this and scratches his head and talks monotonously for all the time. It's not going to inspire you, right? The speaker has to inspire you with passion, with enthusiasm, and make you want to follow. Because if you're speaking on stage, it's not because you are important. It is because your audience is important. And... What happens after the conference, it's what they do that counts. It's not what you do. So if you are trying to spread a message, to get them to do something, to change something, to inspire them, well, they have to act afterwards. They have to change something. So you've got to care for your audience, and you've got to inspire them to follow your lead. And they don't follow somebody who speaks like this and looks like they just want to go to sleep. Because it just sends you to sleep. So the speaker is important. And then the other aspect is the visuals, right? You've got to have visuals which support the message and make it more memorable and not just a long list of points which are notes for the speaker and boredom for the audience. So that's what I do. And all of that is in the service of a central message. Every presentation has to have a message. And every presentation you see today and tomorrow will have a fantastic message. Now... I do this in many places. Earlier this week, I was in the beautiful city of Copenhagen. It was raining, but it was nice at the time this photo was taken. And I was there for an IT company, an IT software company. An IT software company which makes solutions for engineers in plants. Yeah. We were looking forward to a really fun conference. You know the kind of conference where you sit down and you think... Okay, I'm going to be bored as hell for the whole of this conference, but at least there are some free drinks afterwards, right? Well, they actually asked me to help them to make it interesting so the audience would be really fans of them and their products and services and enjoy the conference. And, you know, it went pretty well. But at one point, the, I talked to the chief operating officer of this customer, and I said that after that, I'm going straight down to the south of France, to Santifolia, for an amazing conference for the cosmetics, the beauty, the perfume industry. And he said, wow, that's fantastic. You're going to be surrounded by beautiful women. Can I come and carry your bags? 
Well, I can understand why he'd be jealous, because his usual customer looks more like this. So you can see why the beauty would be interesting. And sure, he's right. We have an amazing number of beautiful women in the room here, many in the organizing team, and we're all lucky to be here with you. But this conference, it may be partly about beauty, but it's not about this kind of beauty. This is a conference which is about truth and goodness and beauty. And if I have not put any photographs in these frames, if I've left these frames empty, it's for a really clear reason. It is because it is impossible to just categorize these concepts in one image. I could try to do it and say what it means for me, but what's important is what truth, goodness, and beauty mean for you. And what I'd like you to try to think and try to do over these next two days is to try to fill in these frames in your mind with the pictures of what they mean for you. To help us with that, I'm now going to ask our first ninja keynote speaker of the morning to come and talk to us about truth, goodness, and beauty and tell us a little more to help to inspire us. So thank you for your welcome. And here, give a warm welcome for Jean-François Noubel. Yeah.